All right, so our room is now open. Thank you all who were just hanging out in our waiting room. I don't know if there's any music in there or if it's like fun or if it's just really like staring at a blank screen. So I appreciate whatever you just dealt with for a couple minutes there as we got set up in our session here. Uh, we'll get started in just a couple more minutes. We have a lot of really great questions that were pre-submitted by our audience that we will ask our panel today, uh, as well as any questions that maybe come in from folks who didn't put it in during a registration. We wanna make this a fun interactive session for everybody who is here. While you're logging in, uh, what would be fun to do is jump into the chat, let us know where you are joining us from today. It's always fun to kind of see, you know, we pick a time and a day for these events and we assume certain folks will join, but already see like we're across the globe already. So Washington DC, India, Germany, uh, a few more from India, Nigeria, uh, a few from Nigeria, which is awesome, South Africa. So some folks that stayed up pretty late or got up early, uh, I guess depends on which day, Louisiana, there we go, Maura, thank you. Uh, Ghana as well, so yeah, Houston, Texas, okay. Um, really, really cool stuff. So keep, keep those coming through as you're joining in. We'll give folks just another couple seconds here to log in and get familiar with the room before we start to introduce our panel. I'll also use this time to just talk really briefly about Clear Admit. So those of you who are not aware of who Clear Admit is and what we do, we are an MBA applicant community for top tier MBA applicants going to the top schools. So there's a lot of really great free resources on our website uh, for those of you who are putting together your MBA applications at this time, everything from essay assistance and advice to interview prep guides, uh, to also our live wire decision tracker, which is pretty active this time of the year as folks are receiving interview invites for the round one schools that they've applied to full time. So if you're one of those folks and you're looking for you know, where your school's at in sending out invites, come check out our feed on live wire. That's really all I'll say about Clear Admit for today. Uh, we wanna get to talking more about MLT and also just our topic for today, which is timing your MBA application When's the right time to hit that submit button? How do you know that you have a strong application? And what are some tips and tricks that our panel can provide who are all attending really, really great schools right now? So um, Maura, I wanna introduce you first uh, from MLT. If you want to kind of introduce yourself, what is it you do over at MLT and what else we should know about your program? Awesome, sounds good. Thanks, Mike. And thank you um, to Mike and his team at Clear Admit for hosting today's session and inviting us to participate. Um, if you are new to MLT, we are glad that you're in this space and that you're going to spend um, the next bit of time here. It might be your lunch break or the middle of the night, but wherever you are, we're glad that you're here. Um, MLT stands for Management Leadership for Tomorrow, and we are a racial equity nonprofit. We're based in Bethesda, Maryland. And if you've been on a presentation with me before, you've heard me say that what we do can be summed up in a handful of words. MLT exists to advance racial equity. And we do that by working with prospective students, with current MBA and college students, all the way through professionals down the road. So most of you, um, as Mike said, are you know, probably found yourself in this session because you are beginning or are on the MBA exploration process. Um, so the current students and alumni that we have on this call have all participated and completed our MBA prep program. So that'll probably be um, a lot of the focus of our conversation. We are actively recruiting students or candidates who are interested in beginning their MBA in fall 2025. So we recruit into MBA prep. It's a one year long, roughly a year long coaching program. Um, would love to be able to tell you more about it. Please do get in touch with our alumni, our students, reach out to me. My contact info is all over our website. Um, and again, thanks to Clear Admit for having us. And I will be here if any really hard questions come in. I mean, if they're like really hard, I'm not probably gonna be able to answer them and I'm gonna throw it to one of the students. Um, but if there's anything I can help with, I'm here. But for right now, I'm just gonna listen and hang out. So thanks very much. Awesome, and thank you for being here and for helping uh, bring this panel together. We have some really great folks that now we should take the time to introduce. And thank you for the person in the chat who mentioned our podcast as well. I appreciate you for doing that. Uh, David, why don't we start with you? Uh, give us you know, your background a little bit, where you're from, what school that you attend. Um, I don't know, maybe like a fun fact. Is that fair to ask everybody? Just something like interesting about yourself? Oh, look at the panel. That was a bad one, I guess. Let's let's try it out. I'll give a fun fact as well. I'll be fair to everybody. So, David, you go first. Absolutely. No, thanks, Mike. Um, David Harris here, uh, currently a second year at Stanford GSB. Prior to coming to the GSB, 
I was in the military for five years. I was in the Air Force for three years uh, doing nuclear cruise missile development, and then two years in the Space Force doing satellite software development. Um, did a short stint at Blackstone before coming to school, and will um, and will be headed to Vista Equity Partners post MBA. And a fun fact is that I was actually born on Thanksgiving uh, during a Cowboys game, and so I'm a huge uh, Cowboys fan. We lost the game, unfortunately, though. <laughs> well, I don't lose too often, even though I live in southern New Jersey, which is Eagles country, and I grew up in New York as a Giants fan. So we'll just leave all that alone because I'm in the middle of like chaos down here right now. I've got the Phillies in the playoffs. The Eagles are like crazy. I just try to stay quiet because I'll get punched. Thank you for your service, David, as well. Um, now we'll switch over to Adrian. How about uh, your introduction as well? Thank you. Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Adrian Dolphin. I'm a graduate of HBS from this past May. Um, Pre-MBA, I worked in tech consulting for a little while and then did uh, marketing technology at Nestle. And now that I've graduated, I'm um, on the brand management team for M&Ms at Mars. Um, and I guess a fun fact for me, um, I'm really big into building a uh, uh, models of like building models. Uh, so I, um, my biggest one so far is I built a four foot um, complete scale model of St. Paul's Basilica um, over the course of um, the COVID quarantine a few years ago. Wow. Uh, yeah. So we'll be looking up photos of that at some point because uh, I need to see what that looks like. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, Darren, how about for you? Hey, so full name, uh, Duran Dixon, uh, currently a Kellogg student, uh, graduating next year, so 2024. Uh, before Kellogg, I was an engineer uh, in the medical device industry, designing hernia repair products. So I did that for about four years. Uh, and this summer, I interned at BCG. Fun fact, uh, not as fun as the two that went before me, or three, I should say, um, but I played cricket in college. So went to school in Jamaica, where cricket is a very popular sport, uh, not so well known here in the USA. But it will be soon, the uh, Olympic Committee for 2028. Are you going to be on the team? I mean, they just announced crickets in the Olympics now. I definitely will not be on the team. I think uh, <laughs> my athletic ability left a long time ago, um, but I will certainly be watching. Listen, you got five years to work out. I think you'll be right back in shape when it's ready to go here. Um, that is a fun fact. I think that's a good one. Uh, Aisha, bring us home. What it, what's uh, your introduction as well? Really cool, fun fact. We have some good ones so far. I know. I hate going last. <laughs> <laughs> But an impressive group of people, so honored to be here. But my name is Asia Johnson. Um, I went to Columbia Business School, class of 2018. Uh, Pre-MBA, I did energy procurement for a number of years. And now I've returned to the supply chain world, and I'm leading responsible sourcing um, for our private label business at Amazon. So I've been here ever since graduating from CBS. Um, fun fact, I guess sticking with the... Um, athletic train. Um, I'm a runner. And so I'm currently based in London. And a really fun um, journey for me has been meeting with different running teams um, uh, in groups here in London and, and really just um, connecting with the community here. So um, yeah, fun fact, I'm a runner and I love running communities. So yes, that's me. Very nice. Like the Olympic sport connection as well. There you go. Um, <laughs> great stuff. And thanks for joining us uh, from over there. Dinner time, right? So uh, so thanks for uh, for hanging out with us. And um, I promised I would have to do one too. So I'll use my fun fact as I was one of the original mascots at my undergrad school. Uh, we introduced the mascot and I was the guy under the helmet for a few years, uh, which was a really good time. So I'm definitely not energetic or fun loving at all. OK, uh, so now we'll go reverse order to be fair, because you're correct. Ish, it is tough going last. So we'll start with you. Pretty easy question, right? Like when you're thinking about when you applied for MBA, what were some of the things that really took a long time for you to prepare? Like things that just, you know, and maybe it could have either been just they did take a long time or you didn't expect them to. And then they ended up taking a long time and you kind of wish you would have done things differently, maybe. So um, give us some tips there. 
Yeah, it's it's a great question. Um, I would say for me and um, maybe others feel the same way. Um, thankfully, through the MLT process, um, I had that that blueprint right for um, just steps to go through and milestones throughout the journey along the way. Um, but for me, I would say what took the longest uh, to feel comfortable with uh, and really honing is my story. Um, I think that's something that we, um, everyone that goes through the process needs to take time to reflect on your why, you know, why business school is the right next step for you. Um, what is the experience gap you're looking to close um, and feeling really good about that story and that story being authentically you to be able to um, be confident through that journey of taking the GMAT writing your essays, it feels there's a flow that comes from that comfort, right? And that confidence that you have once you feel really good about your story. And so did anybody else have a similar thought to that, like putting your story together? And yeah, I see Duran, you came off mute. What do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, um, I'd say that's what took the longest for me as well. Uh, so I really putting getting the essays uh, to a place that I was very comfortable. And the reason for that was just fleshing out my story and um, having a lot of clarity around uh, my YMBA, my career goals, and also uh, clarity around the brand that I wanted to portray as well. Makes sense. Yeah. No, yeah. Oh, sorry. No, I, I mean, that was a great point uh, to start us off. Uh, I think... Uh, kind of more tactically, like I literally wrote down everything that I could ever, that I thought, sorry, that I thought was interesting about me. And I'm like, okay, these are the story. I have to choose either one, at least one of these stories to put in put my essays. And I think narrowing those stories down and then finding a common theme and thread through those stories was uh, definitely took a you know, large amount of time to to refine and, and be comfortable with uh, submitting. So I 100% agree. Did anybody find it difficult to, um, and Adrian, I'll, I'll, I'll go to you in one second, but did you find it difficult to be introspective, to really like pull those stories out? Um, I know I hear a lot of times applicants kind of find it difficult to almost sound braggy on one end, but you're trying to tell your story and it's factual and you want to come off as a strong applicant, right? So did anybody have a difficult time striking that balance of um, really like putting yourself out there for a school? Nobody on this panel. Well, that's good. Okay. So normally we see that. So that's good. So don't do that. Um, and Adrian, go ahead. What What's your thoughts on this question? Um, so I was going to say that um, the story was not very hard for me. The, the hardest part of the application um, for me was actually narr narrowing down the exact schools I was going to apply to. Um, when I started out, I literally had a, a list of, I think, like 10 schools that I was planning to apply to. And then my MLT coach uh, saw that list and was just like, no, you're not applying. <laughs> you're not applying to 10 schools. Um, and MLT um, really helped me be able to hone in on what I actually wanted out of an MBA program. And then through that MLT network, I was able to connect with current and former students. Um, with MBA prep, we had a couple of conferences where I went to so some of these schools and HBS was not even on my on that 10 list of 10 schools at the beginning. But then once there was one of the conferences at HBS, I was like, "This now it has to be go on there. This is amazing." And so I uh, that that was the hardest part for me. I, I kept changing that list all the way until like the day um, that applications were due. That's that's pretty funny, actually. So you had ten. So this was number eleven somehow, and it's HBS. That's I love that. Okay, um, just a funny funny thing to to think about. Anybody else have a, a similar story to that? Like you had a school list issue or anything like that where you were kind of like really confused on where to go or just no we're good there um so adrian you touched on a good point there of how kind of mlt was able to assist you with narrowing down your list really figuring out where's the best place for you um would anybody else want to touch on that did, did mlt kind of assist you through finding your story finding your why helping you with a with a program selection david uh, go ahead yeah i think um I mean, first off, hats off, Coach Candice. Sorry to the other panelists. She's the GOAT, uh, just hands down. But uh, but I think uh, just with the coaching, uh, like from that aspect, like to a similar point, like Stanford wasn't even on my list when, when I originally started to apply to business schools. Uh, but my MLT coach and her infinite wisdom, you know, kind of like, hey, this is a really good place. I don't think you truly understand what's going on there fully. And, you know, do some more research. And sure enough, I did and realized similar uh, to Adrian is like, wow, this is an incredible, incredible uh, place and somewhere I can see myself, you know, for the next two years and then being alumni of. So I think just from that perspective, it was just 
having the experience and, you know, foresight, like, hey, I think you should look at this school as well. It was, uh, was incredible for me to know, too. Okay. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll have to <laughs> shout, out, uh, shout out the, uh, or my goal, I should say, uh, Coach Natasha Gore. Um, thought she did a great job with me. Um, yeah, I think MLT um, had a really good, a pretty well-defined process to research, to not only research schools, but to also rank them based on what mattered to the individual. Um, and I found that to be very, very helpful. I think going into the process, it's very easy to just focus on, say, um, you know, rankings you may come across online. Um, but MLT really pushed us to define what mattered most to us what were we trying to get out of those two years um and then looking at you know what schools really aligned with that best so i found that to be uh very very helpful um and there were also like a lot of journaling prompts as well that i found uh really helped to begin that process of introspection and developing the clarity that would then bring you to the place to be able to define what what should matter most yeah, I love that. Staying away from the actual, the, right, the other rankings where it's, that's not made for you, right? That's just a ranking that's somebody else. It's arbitrary. It's based on random numbers. Like what, what's your actual school ranking? That makes a lot of sense. Go ahead, Asia. I was just going to um, add to the conversation, the idea that you are um, a part of this beautiful community, you know, of others that are, that believe in you, that are high achievers. Um, it's just really just a profound experience to go through this with others who are in it with you um, and to have um, an accountability group along the way. Um, and I think for me, that was really helpful for being able to get through the marathon, you know, because it's not a sprint, um, as you know, as we all know. And so it was really instrumental to have um, my community and the local cohort that was there to support me along the way, which was facilitated by MLT. So also have to shout out Krista, who is just an incredible coach. Um, so yeah, got to shout her out. <laughs> Are there any bad coaches? They're all great, it sounds like. So number one, <laughs> hot seat for coaching there. Okay, just the football coaches. Got it. Um, so one thing I'll, I'll point out, we we jumped into this session and, you know, it was put together by more. It's a great group of folks already. We're, we're having some great conversations. And one thing that happened when we all logged in is Duran and David kind of popped on camera and right away you're like, oh, what's up? I haven't seen you. How are you doing? When's the last time you've actually seen each other, the two of you? I think it was at uh, Tux Black Ski uh, in Park City, uh, February this year. Um, I think that's yeah. the last time we saw each other in person. Right. So yeah, we actually got really matched room together as well. So it was, it was even better. That's funny. And the reason I point that, so Asia pointed out, like the community, there's this great network, right? You two were, you were eight months back. Um, haven't seen, and you popped on, like you just saw each other yesterday, like the conversation right away. It's like, oh, what's up? How you doing? What's up? You know, what'd you have for dinner last night? It's amazing. And, and I mentioned too, like I've done other events with, with MLT alum, the community, like, I, I don't need to be told that the community is strong. Like I see it every time I do events with folks who've gone through the MLT process. Um, so I just want to point out that interaction because not everybody who was here got to see that you were in the waiting room. So again, I don't know what happens in the waiting room, but uh, I was having some, some great conversations here. So I uh, wanted to make sure that got onto the recording here for everyone who's not with us today. Uh, so one next uh, question here. If you were to go back and start the process over again, is there some piece of advice, word of advice uh, that you would give yourself, like knowing what you know now, right? So you've gone through it all. You're all at great schools. Is there anything that you could have told somebody who might be in your shoes today, sitting in the session, listening to you? Um, who wants to take that one on first? <laughs> somebody has to go first. I don't want to call. It's not class. I'm not going to do a pop up call on folks, right? Uh, I can, I can go you. first. <laughs> um, I, I would say probably have have confidence in yourself from the beginning. Um, Part of the reason I had those tens, that list of 10 schools was because I was not confident I would get into any school. And I, I was like, I have to just spread, spread my wings, just do as many chances as possible. Um, and so that really um, not having that confidence in myself and, and my application and my work experience um, really sort of changed the dynamics of how I was approaching my story and how I was approaching um, 
you know, networking with um, current uh, students and alumni. And so sort of as I got more confidence, as I was getting better at my GRE, GMAT, <laughs> GMAT prep and uh, writing writing my, my applications, um, that was something that I I wish at the beginning I had been a little a little bit more more confident and in, in my goals and in my work experience so I wouldn't have been sort of trying to hedge my bets throughout the whole process. Yeah, that's great advice, and that's tough to do, right? I mean, that's that's part of what I was trying to allude to earlier. Is like sometimes you come into this process and you see the schools and what they accept and the stats and everything. It's like it's it's scary, right? It, it does it throws you off, um, but it's nice to hear, right? That don't don't let that bother you. Don't let the stats, the stuff on paper get in your way, be an obstacle. I mean, put your best foot forward and, and look, you're all in great spots. So, um, Duran, I saw you come off mute, so I'll go back to you. Yeah, um, really just echoing what uh, Adrian said, uh, just being confident in uh, my own ability, um, and my ability to get into these schools. Um, and I would say more importantly to uh, really being confident in MLT's process. Uh, I think after going through it, uh, when I looked back, I really realized that I was just a, a very well-oiled machine. And um, in leaning in, uh, I think you know, uh, it essentially brought me to, to where I am today. That's a great tip. David, go ahead. And uh, I can jump in with two things. One, um, do MLT. <laughs> I'll just say that's, that was probably one of the biggest things um, that helped me throughout this whole, actually, it is the biggest piece of the whole process that was that helped me out a lot for you know, several different reasons. But I think a big piece of that is the number, the second thing that I was going to bring up is that knowing that it's all going to work out. I know it's tough to like, you know, look like looking forward, think that, but it, it will all work out. Like I said, I wasn't even planning to apply to Stanford. And now, you know, I'm big at Stanford and you know, I'm wearing the Stanford gear right now and it got my dream job through Stanford. So um, I just, you, you always just know everything's going to work out. And I will say when my mindset during the whole process is I just need one. You know, I just need one yes, you know, at the end of the day. And I think just going with that mentality it will help alleviate some of the some of the stress uh, with the application process. There you go. Here's your go ahead. I, I feel like what I'm going to share is just um, related to all the points, the great points that have already been shared. But the last thing I'll share is, is don't self-edit. Um, I think that comes with confidence through the journey, right, of doing the work, being introspective, letting things flow. Um, once you get comfortable with your story and um, trust the process, right? Obviously, it is a well-oiled machine. I agree with that. So trust the process and and go with it and have and have fun along the way. You know, I think that's also a big part of it is having fun and and enjoying the experience as much as you can. Um, getting confident with your story. All great advice. Thank you all for for all that great stuff. And um, and yeah, leaning on on the network and leaning on your resources around you. Now, with with some of these tricks that you kind of encountered through the process, did any of you have to change your timeline at all? Whether it was quicker or slower, Adrian, I see you shaking your head. Yes. Do you want to like talk through like how did you make your decision on when was the best time to really hit that submit button? Like how do you how do you know like this is this is my moment? Yeah. Um. I think a lot, a lot of that came through conversations with my coach, uh, coach Candace, um, from MLT, because I ended up, um, I went through the entire MLT program. Um, and then on the last day deferred the MLT program and went through it again, <laughs> a second year. Um, and so that was like in conversations with, my, with my coach, um, it, I was really able to think through out loud, you know, like I'm having some misgivings about what I actually want to do. And if this, if an MBA is even right for me, or maybe I want to do something else. Um, and I wasn't confident in my G GRE or GMAT score at that time, um, particularly for the schools that were, that were on my list. Um, and coach Candace was able to talk through of like, okay, if you, if you, you know, if you do want to apply now, like, I feel like you could apply now, but you know, if you take that extra time, I also feel like you could get, you know, uh, that better GRE score, that more confidence in what you want to, to do um, next. And it was really working with my coach made me more confident in, in that decision of no, now is not the right time. And then when it was the right time the next year, I I, I was so sure that I was gonna, that I was gonna get in somewhere. <laughs> I love that. That's great. And so you you did. You felt that more confidence. You felt like you were gonna 
probably have a better process, right? Get better decisions, get better responses from the school. So it's a big decision, but I mean, it worked out. So that's, that's awesome. Shout out to the coaches again. I got to shout out all the coaches who said all that. Anybody else, any, like any story like that, or, I mean, that's a, that's a great one. We can stop there. Anybody take the GMAT or GRE, right? Like more than three times. Does anybody go like, yep. Okay. And more than four times. Okay. More than five times. No. Yes. More than six times. David, how many times? <laughs> I actually don't remember. I try to block that part of my mind. <laughs> It's a, it's a black uh, hole now, right? You're in a school that never have to take that test again. I'm out. <laughs> uh, I think it was uh, six times because we got an extra one due to COVID um, and they just started online. Once so, yeah, I think it was a total of six. Yeah. Okay. And you ended up at Stanford. So obviously six is not too many, right? That's, that's a common myth that people ask is if I take it too many times, will I be looked down upon? It seems like that's not, yeah, that's not the case, right? The only time you know you're taking too many is if you go to GMAC and try to sign up and they say no. That's that's the point you took too many. But <laughs> so you, you've, hit, you've maxed out your car. That's it. You're, you're done. We can't take any more of your money. We're done. Um, that's awesome. Okay, so that's that's a common question. We got that submitted pre, uh, pre-session. So I want to make sure we kind of jumped on that. Uh, so we've heard a lot about the MLT coaches as part of that kind of support system within your community, right? So um, it helps to kind of have a community behind you when you're going through this process. We've talked a lot about having that confidence to to apply and that can come from many sources, right? So you have your MLT coaches is one of those sources. Were there any other people in your life that helped you through this process as you went along uh, that you would suggest that other people on the session should kind of lean upon or call on while they're going through the application process? Could be family or, uh, you know, colleagues at work or, or other things, um, maybe other, you know, networks outside of the ones that we've already mentioned. Um, anything that strikes, you know, that in your memory. <laughs> I actually had outside of my MLT coach, uh, coach Natasha, I had one other person that I really leaned on throughout the process. Uh, they were at Wharton in their first year at the time that I was applying. Um, but we went to high school together in Jamaica. So he really knew me from, you know, just way back. Uh, and I thought that there's a lot of uh, value that he brought to the table because of that long history. Um, but outside of him, uh, Kamar England, shout out to him. Um, outside of him uh, and Coach Natasha, uh, I didn't feel the need to, to have anyone else to lean on throughout the process. Cool. Okay. David? I jump in as here as well. Um... For me, it was, I just had a great support group that was applying with me um, that, you know, they were all M- MLT, but similar to the run, uh, we all went to undergrad together. And so it was kind of this, you know, four person group that, you know, we would get Saturday mornings, we get on, you know, whatever the hardest, three hardest GMAT problems we had, we would go over those, you know, together and, you know, every Saturday morning, we would do group GMAT uh, consulting sessions. We would review each other's essays. We talk through strategy. I think that kind of helped alleviate a lot of the stress as well, like having someone to talk to, similar to Ron, like going through the process I, that, that that you're actively going through together with. Um, I think that was, for me, extremely helpful, just finding that community, um, of course, through MLT and also uh, undergrad. It makes sense. And yeah, I think the reason, and, and Aisha, I'll go to you in one second, but the reason I think too, for this question, sometimes you feel like you're on an island, right? Like you're, you're applying to school and you might be the only person in your close circle who's applying. Uh, so looking for these other groups that you can join or, you know, finding people that happen to be applying or went to your undergrad that you could reconnect with. Uh, I think it's important. It's important to kind of look for those groups for the reasons that you both have already mentioned. Um, so Asia, go ahead. Yeah, that was exactly my point, Mike. I was just going to say also I found community at work. Um, I think that can be hard for some people to be um, trying to navigate how honest you want to be about your intentions, right? But I was able to find people who um, had MBAs who were supportive of me and and, um, took coffee chats with me to talk through their journey. Um, So look all around you, right, Um, to see who, who is there, who may be willing to help you and provide some advice along the way. Love it. That sounds good. Um, and with people at work, right? So I'm imagining all of you had to use somebody at work as a recommender. Uh, so would you have any advice on how to coach up your recommenders? It's another common, commonly asked question that we see a lot. 
Uh, and maybe Asia in your situation, right? And for anyone else who went through that too, where it is tough. It's tough to go to somebody who may be your superior to ask for a recommendation to a full-time program while at the same time trying to answer that question of like, well, you're going to leave in a couple months because I don't know if I should be writing this for you. I like you here. I don't want you to leave. So um, any thoughts or, or ways that you can kind of navigate those difficult conversations you can help our audience with? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, so first of all, you want to definitely give your recommenders sufficient time, right? You want to engage them early in the process. Um, I believe that um, MLT had suggested um, and has like a template for like a brag sheet, right, to be able to provide that to your recommender. Um, so definitely um, put thought into that. Um, be very specific, you know, about um, what you want them to highlight about you, what part of your story you want them to um, to speak to in that recommendation. Um, and, and, you know, nurture that relationship, right? Set up a call um, to talk through it, um, take them to coffee, right? Um, again, make sure you do it and with sufficient time. And the last tip I will share is just to thank them, um, right? Make sure you send them a gift. Um, make sure you really show your, your appreciation for their time and their investment in you and your future. Great tips. Awesome stuff. David, yeah. And um, I mean, to kind of that point, I was, you know, was in the military. So that's definitely not a place where you openly, you know, express your interest in going to the NBA, you know, as far as separating. And so it, it was even to the point where I had someone, a classmate from undergrad who I was next door to, I've known since 2013, we actually worked together. And admin weekend, we come up, we just pull up, we're like, you know, what are you doing here? And it's like, we both got admitted. We didn't even know we were applying. And I just talked to him you know, extensively you know, a few months before that. So I would say in a, you know, a situation like that, you really have to be uh, strategic. And I think that was something that I was fortunate that I have a, when I had a really great boss, but, you know, I, I, I didn't like spring it on them last second. I, I told them about a year in advance, like, hey, that's something I'm really interested in doing. You know, give you sufficient time in this case, you know, he needs to replace me. Um, I would, you know, appreciate it if this stay between us. You know, I think you having those type of conversations really helped me. Um, but also building trust with with my with my boss was was very important. So I think those two aspects is, you know, if you're in that situation, is very, very important, you know, just being strategic and building trust. Uh, within your, uh, you know, with your supervisor. Yeah, makes sense. Maybe that's good. Um, so we did have a question come in, which I'll go to. And if there are any other questions from our audience who's here, feel free to put them in the Q and A. If if we can get to them, we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, so a nice easy one, I hope. Uh, which MLT programs did each of you participate in? Um, so we can go around for all four. Yeah, Duran, go ahead. So, yeah, I did both uh, MBA prep and um, MLT PD. Um, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Adrian. Go ahead. Um, I've, I've been um, involved with MLT for a long time. I did career prep back in undergrad, um, uh, uh, ML, MBA prep, and then PD as well. I'm sorry. Yeah, I see in the chat, uh, professional development. And I did MBA prep only. Yeah, I'll, uh, similar to Adrian, I'm a triple MLT -er. I will do a, the uh, next program that they put out. So more, please, please let us know. Keep, keep them coming. Um, but I did the MBA prep accelerated. I did um, MLT professional development and also did MLT XP, which is their private equity um, sort of accelerator. And also just to shout out to uh, PD, I got the job that I'm currently in now through the internship that I had from PD. So it, it took me all the way. <laughs> so more, you got some, this is great. I mean, I know you're, we were supposed to talk about like one program. We got a lot of programs we could talk about and David wants more. So just go bring that back to the office and keep churning out more programs. Uh, so David can join them. Uh, another question that came in here, is uh and let me make sure i'm reading this before i try to ask it so what advice can you give to an applicant who's going to apply to i'm assuming mlt prep who has not yet taken the gmat gre uh, i guess first off is that even allowed to apply to mlt prep without a test score and then what's your advice to somebody who has not taken their test yet um so more you want to jump in on that yeah go ahead yeah i'm going to jump in because uh i i will briefly explain um our testing policy, I'll summarize it. 
Um, so we are what we consider a test preferred program, which means the admissions committee, which is comprised of our coaches, um, prefers that everyone applies to MBA prep with either an official GMAT, GRE, or we also accept the executive assessment. Don't We don't get a ton of those. Um, but if you have a cumulative undergraduate GPA that is a 2.9 or lower, you are required to apply with an official score. If you have a 3.0 or higher for your cumulative undergrad GPA, then you have the option to apply with or without a score. Um, if you apply without a score, I really urge you to look at your application and be able to say, you know, does my application without a score display my quantitative aptitude? So can you really show that, you know, maybe you're a statistics undergrad or, you know, a math major or something and you have a lot of quant. And so then that could be the right option. Um, regardless of whether or not candidates apply with a score or without a score, all fellows are required to have an official score by May 1st. So even if you're able to apply without a score, you're just kind of like pushing it down the field a little bit further, which can be good for some people. You know, if, you, if you're getting married this fall, you might not have time right now to take the GMAT and you need a little more time. Um, but but we do we we hope that everybody takes the score. And what would all the what would all the current and former fellows say about the test? Like wait and work on it slowly throughout the program, or get it done and you know give it your all and get it done. I'm curious about that. I think getting it done early is best if you are able to get it done early. Not everyone is able to do that. Um, I was fortunate in that. Um, I got my desired score pretty early in the program. So I was able to focus on, you know, uh, introspection and my story and the essays um, <clears throat> from, from what earlier out. Yeah, I would say try to knock it out, uh, you know, as soon as possible. I would don't, you know, don't sprinkle time here and there, but you know, go all in on it and just, just get it done as fast as possible, whether that's in the program. And I think, um, Prepping for homework, I, I think you like you can apply and then still you know increase your score. So that was something that that I did. You know, I took the test once, used that to apply to MLT, but was continuing to to study and then increase my score to what you know I applied with. So I think that that's also you know a great option as well if you fall in that bucket, um, just not finished before the applications do. Um, so that was kind of what I did, but definitely knock it out as soon as possible. I was just going to add quickly that for me, um, I knew that I wanted to apply to business school before I knew about MLT. So I took an um, in-person MBA prep course, um, which really helped me kind of jumpstart my, my journey. So I would just um, encourage folks to figure out what kind of environment you need um, and resources you need uh, to to knock that out um, and to kind of jumpstart that journey. Um, but yeah, I, I took an in-person course, um, online resources, and also did some in-person um, tutoring <laughs> through the entire MLT journey. So yes, it took me a, a long time to get my um, the score I felt confident in. So yeah, start as early as you can. Great. And um, so, David, just a quick follow up for you, since you said you continue to take your test, that there was a second portion of that question, actually, that I wasn't sure would apply here. But it was, did having to take one of those tests while you were in the program, did that affect your experience at all with with the prep program? And this and I finished testing before we actually got into the the, the real okay. potato program. So it was just through the application process that I was continuously uh, for MLT, for MLT, that MLT application process where I was continuous. Got it. Okay. All right, cool. Just want to make sure we uh, gave that a, a chance, if, the, if that made sense. So yes, I think getting it done early, and, and I agree, we do hear that from a lot of folks. GMAT versus GRE, uh, how many were GMAT? I know we asked how many times, but how many actually submitted GMAT scores at the end of the day? Three and GRE? GRE, okay. And everyone got into schools, right? So either test, whichever one you will get the best score, go with that. Um, our recommendation at ClearMit is always like, kind of look at both and take like maybe a test on each, like a practice test on each, whichever one seems like your better one, like maybe dive into that one first 
if you need to switch, you can always switch, but kind of like taking two or three of the same one might make sense. They are different exams and different people do better on different exams. So um, you won't know which one you are better at until you take them both. So uh, just a little bit of uh, added advice there. Um, so another question that came in, this is great. So keep sending these questions in. Uh, this is around the issue of time, right? The uh, resource that is very limited, right? Um, what is the appropriate amount of time to give your recommenders? So that was mentioned before, I think Asia, you kind of were talking about the amount of time that you, you give your recommenders. And then uh, second portion of this question, how much time did it take you to draft, edit and complete and eventually submit your essays? And um, I'll preface that second portion of the question by, I think it will depend on which school you're applying to and how many schools you're applying to to answer that question because um, each school has very different essay prompts. Uh, some, you know, short answers only, some that are kind of really long introspective essays that are difficult to answer. So keeping that in mind, I guess, right, uh, just maybe with your own experiences at the schools that you're at, what would be your answers to those questions? So again, uh, time for your recommender and then time to do your complete essays who wants to kick us off with this one and this could be kind of quick around the horn if we want to um since there may be different answers right because everyone's got a different background i think also just your ability as a writer might be different for different people right so some people might not be great at writing i'm not great at writing so i might need more time to have my essays edited uh because i don't know where to put commas it just doesn't happen for me i have no idea i don't know what a semicolon even is uh, that button, I think, doesn't exist on my laptop. So there you go. Duran's with me. Uh, so I would need a lot of time. I would need to hire like a professional proofreader to uh, to do that for me. So uh, anybody want to dive in on these? I will call on people. I'll be mean. I, uh, Adrian, I'll ahead. say okay, <laughs> for the writing portion, number one, set aside more time than you think you're going to need. Um, I, I, th I thought I was a great writer. Um, I still needed more time than I, than I thought I needed. And MLT was, I think, great for setting the, you know, the, I don't know, boundaries or like set, setting very responsible time limits and that there was a a sort of schedule that you had to follow um, with your with your coach for like their reviews and things like that. Um, so I wasn't leaving it till the last minute, which again, I would also say <laughs> not, not to do. Um, and so like, being able to to go through that as sort of like a process where like I was as I was writing my coach was 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 reviewing there was an, a formal MLT process for reviews as well um and then also with with my coach I worked out an application schedule so I didn't apply only to round one I I had I applied to some schools in round one and then I had plans to apply to some schools in round two so that I wasn't doing like a bunch of essays all at the same time with different prompts and structures um and so that's something that you know i i think if i if i had done this without mlt i would have been writing all my application essays a week uh, a week before for um round two only and that's definitely don't do that <laughs> Great advice and good also smart to split between the different rounds, right? And that's why there are rounds of admission. And so people think it's scary to apply in the later rounds because there's a lot of rumors about that impacting your application and your chances to get in. People get in all the rounds, everybody, like that's just how it works. Otherwise, why would we even have those rounds, right? So split your apps over the rounds. If it helps you space out your time, again, you can't get more time, right? Like the time passes and that's, that's what it is. So, um, okay. Anybody else want to tackle that or, or different things to add, I guess, cause that was a great answer. So we may be good there. Okay. So, um, so I think that's enough said for that, uh, for the next question, um, someone, and this is good. And Mara, we may need you for this one too, but, uh, eight years of experience debating, applying to an MBA, first off, apply to an MBA, just do it right. So go for it. Uh, but you don't have the test score that you want, considering applying to MLT to uh, to go through the process, concerned about being pushed into the EMBA bucket, should this person be worried? I would say no, but more, I don't know if you have a thought. <laughs> I get a lot, there's a lot of unknown unknowns with this, right? So yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll say that. <laughs> sure. um, I think this, my, my first thought is that through this MBA search process, you get this annoying answer from people of like, it depends. 
And it's very school specific. So if you have a couple schools in mind that you're like, this is where I'd want to be. If you're not already in touch with their admissions folks, I encourage you to reach out to them to ask specifically with your you know, profile, you mentioned about the eight years, um, how do they approach that? There are definitely some full-time daytime MBA programs that will say like, yeah, you're, you are certainly still a fit for our overall class profile. And most importantly, for what our employer partners are looking for as far as recruiting opportunities. Um, some schools may say, you know, at our school specifically, you do look more like an executive MBA. And the reason is X, Y, and Z. Um, so I, I truly believe that schools want to find the best place for you. So that way you can leverage your background. Um, for MLT at this time, we only have partners that are the full-time daytime programs. So although we do support Executive, a, executive MBA applications. And what I mean by that is if you are a fellow and say you have seven years of experience and you are going to apply to three kind of full-time traditional programs, but then you think, you know, I'm also going to apply to an executive program that's in my home city. We will help you with that application, but we don't have the, they're not, they're not partners of ours per se. So if you're, if when it comes to the time of really knowing your strategy, if you're only going to target executive MBAs, then right now MLT is probably not the best fit for you um, as far as supporting you in that process. But I do think it's something good to talk through with schools um, individually. Yeah. And more just to underline that point, I, I think another thing that between applicants and admissions offices, the, the wires get crossed. They're not going to say, yeah, apply because we want to deny you. Like that's not something that an admissions officer is going to be doing. So if they do recommend, like you said, you know, for our specific program, looking at your profile, you might be a better fit for the EMBA versus the full-time. That's good advice at that specific school. And if you want to go full-time, that might not be the school for you. Maybe you got to look somewhere else, but they're never going to say to you, oh, just apply, like, you know, you'll be fine. And then it's an automatic denial. Like that's not, that's not what these folks are looking to do. Uh, and I've spoken to many of them. So, uh, so believe us on that. Uh, great answer there. Let's see. Uh, this is actually a nice one. So what are your favorite memories from any of the MLT seminars or any of your MLT experiences at large? I'll open it up to beyond the seminars, but anybody have like a favorite moment or favorite memory or just kind of like a nice thing they want to share? Uh, lots of smiling faces, which is great. So there's good memories at least, right? They didn't say favorite had to be good, but it looks like they're good memories. Um, who wants to kick this one off? This should be a good one, I think. Adrian, you saved me too many times, so I can't let you save me again. Someone else has to save me on this one. David, thank you. Yeah, um, it's interesting because I don't, I'm actually the only person that actually did MLT in person on the panel, unfortunately, because we, we were we were in the COVID year. But I will say my favorite um, MLT event is it isn't uh, professional, but it's when we all, I mean, annually we take a trip down to Mexico. And so just the whole MLT class. And so that was probably, and I got to see, and that was like the first time I met a lot of people in person. And so that was like an incredible um, experience that I really, really enjoyed. So and I mean, I, it is, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and I was just going to second that. Um, yeah, I mean, David and I were in the same uh, cohort. And yeah, that trip down to Mexico was 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 phenomenal. Uh, I think maybe about 150 of us, uh, you know, we'd all just gotten in. Uh, it was just great experience bonding with everybody. I'll add to this and say, um, first of all, pre-MBA, it was literally life-changing and so important to have local folks studying at Starbucks on a Friday night. <laughs> Um, obviously not where I would want to be on a Friday night, but just connecting, you know, going through GMAT questions, learning about each other, supporting each other, learning about someone's, you know, wife or kid or father. Um, that was just lovely getting to connect with um, MLT um, cohort members through that experience. And then once I started, I loved like walking in a room knowing that I would know at least one person from MLT. And I feel like my whole class was like, how do y'all know each other? Like what, 
what is something I missed? I'm like, yeah, you did. <laughs> so, you know, the network is just super powerful and, and always walking to a space where you feel like, you know, someone I think really made a big difference in my, um, my MBA experience. So that's what I'll add. Um, mine's, a, I think, a little different from, from everyone else's. Uh, at one of the uh, conferences for um, uh, ML, MLT uh, at HBS, they organized um, for, for us a case class where everyone from MLT got to do a real case. They split us up into three classrooms with a real HBS professor. We had to read the case beforehand. Um, I got the cold call um, for for that class. And that's why that's, you keep that's saving really us my, now, my right? Favorite. Oh, I'm sorry, what? That's why you keep saving us now, because you know how that goes. Yeah. Oh, exactly. <laughs> um, but that was really my favorite because that's something that I would not have gotten without MLT. Like, students who are or, uh, app, uh, potential applicants who came to, to HBS when I was there, like you can sit in on uh, a case discussion, but they don't participate. And this was a real case discussion we did through MLT where we were all doing a real case class. Um, and that was, it, I felt like it was just an, an opportunity I would never have gotten without MLT. And it was sort of the moment that made me decide to apply to HBS. I was going to ask you that and you already beat me to it. I was wondering. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, all right, let's see. So we have a couple more and I know we're running short on time as well. So we'll try to knock out as many as we can. And if we don't get to your question um, more, I'm sure you'll be able to share maybe contact information and, and stuff specific, especially about MLT uh, that we can ask uh, tomorrow after the session. So that'd be great. So um, one that came in, what are some tips? This is back to essay writing, right? So essay writing, brainstorming, all this kind of stuff. What, what are some impactful exercises that you may have gone through to help you come up with your ideas for your essays? I think, Duran, you mentioned earlier, kind of making a list of everything you've ever done, right? And, and trying to figure out kind of where that fits into things. Um, I think that was David. Was it David? That made the list. Um, uh, I was on the right side of my screen. Okay. I knew it was, okay. <laughs> Close. I've also done that too, just didn't mention it on the call. Um, but yeah, I found that to be very helpful. Essentially, just trying to put your thoughts on paper. So really just spitting everything out. Because I think when it's on paper, you then do a much better job of figuring out uh, what are the better stories or, or the easier stories to tell and how should you organize the stories as well. Um, and then I had mentioned before that MLT gave a lot of journal prompts that I found to be very helpful um, so my essay process, I would argue, started the day I got into MLT or the day I did my first assignment for MLT because I had to like put these stories down on paper for the assignments. And those were the stories that I went back to when I actually started the formal essay writing process. Awesome. Yeah, and just to second, second that, uh, yeah, I think creating that list was was so helpful and I and I and I created it as I was going just to just to keep track of things. Someone recommended I do it um just in case. And so luckily I needed their advice. But that was so helpful because then I took that list with my incredible MLT coach and we looked through it and picked like, hey, this story is actually pretty interesting. You know, let's narrow this down to you know 12 stories. I think these are the most impactful that you know you can come up with. Let's let's write around those. And so then writing, you know, writing out those stories and then, you know, narrowing that down, okay, you know, to your point earlier, Mike, you know, this, this school has a short answer essay. No, you can use that story. You know, we have 12 to pick from now. I think these three fit together very well. And then now that you look at the essays where, you know, they're long, thought, thoughtful, um, you know, prompts, now it's okay. Do you want to take a mosaic approach? Do you just want to use one of these stories? I think you can use three. And there's a common theme with these three that I think will resonate um, very well, you know, just as knowing you as a person. I think going through that side of that sort of narrowing down, you know, starting with a large funnel and, you know, getting down to the, the core essence of who you are, I think was, um, it was extremely profound for me, uh, just making the, the, you know, the progressions very logical and step by step. Great. Anything else that's different? No. Okay. Uh, we'll go with one that I guess we can kind of do again, like kind of around the, the horn here because we have all different schools. Um, there's a, again, this is like a admissions myth, right? So we'll, we'll call it that Mythbusters. 
so usually the questions ask schools prefer candidates with three to five years of work experience. Do you see more candidates that are closer to five or closer to three? Um, I have an answer to this as well, but um, so I guess distribution of age ranges and work experience ranges within your classrooms. Do you see it across the scale? Are you seeing just people in that range? I mean, there's many ways we can answer this, but um, who wants to start this one? Go ahead, David. And, and yeah, that easily, I think the average, um, you know, work experience at GSB, I think is around five years. So, I mean, I don't think it's, you know, you're not, you know, you're not disregarded if you have three years. I know we skew on the younger side as far as age um, at GSB, but even including that, we had, you know, NBA two last year who was 44. Um, and you have one, you know, I'm 30. And so I think, you know, it just kind of depends on what we, like your story, where you are in life and kind of what you did before. But I think they, they take all that to consideration. You know, I think they're, they're very good at their job, but, you know, the, the admission officers. So they, they, they kind of understand what's going on. So uh, like I said, just apply like that, based on, you know, that's what Mike said in the beginning. It's just apply. Why not? Right. I mean, might as well. <laughs> Duran, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think at a Kellogg, the average um, <clears throat> work experience is pretty similar to what David said. Um, and then similarly, um, there was a 42 year old that I did a school trip with this year. And then there are some folks who've done like two years of consulting uh, and they're at school as well. So uh, the average is the average and then we see people uh, skewing on both sides. Asia, Adrian, similar. Yeah, Adrian, go ahead. Yeah, same same at HBS. Um, I was I'm outside of that, or I was outside of that three to five year range when when I applied. Um, and it, there was there was people who had done some kind of like two plus two program at, at HBS. There were people um older. Um, I would say what's more important is um what your planned next steps are after your your MBA. Like, is it something where you know maybe the amount of experience that you have might discourage that in some way? Like, there's not. I don't think there's a lot of jobs where you you could have too much experience before your MBA. But just take take that into consideration if you're doing like a career switch or or something like that through through your MBA. Like how that could could impact not necessarily the ad, I, I don't think the admissions cares that that much about the exact years you you of work you have great point connecting all those dots that's why putting your full application together right it, it all has to make sense in coordination everything essays your resume it all, it all gets connected so that is a great point if you come in with two years of experience and say my next job is going to be you know ceo of amazon probably won't be maybe but it probably won't be uh, so it's, you know, making sure that the progression makes sense, right? So that way uh, that school can look at you and say, yeah, you have two years, but your goals make sense. You're a strong applicant. You're going to fit well in the program. You're going to do great things while you're here, become a great alum. Uh, and then yeah, eventually maybe, you know, take over for Bezos when he decides to sell his boat and, or, or I guess ride off on his boat. I don't know what he's going to do with the boat, but something with the boat. Uh, Asia, anything else to add for, uh, for this kind of similar stuff, right? So uh, one thing I guess that we can end on as, as we're getting down to the bottom of the hour here. Uh, so your experience going into your MBA program, finishing your MBA program for some of you as well, or about to finish, right? So how has MLT supported your journey to where you are today? And not saying that your accomplishments and getting into the schools, like I'm not going from that angle, but you know, how has MLT really like brought you to where you're at today right like what are some of the things that they've supported you with through your journey um that you want to share Adrian, you want to go for all right adrian go oh, ahead yeah. save me again <laughs> cold call <laughs> go ahead adrian <laughs> I, I i i was gonna say a shout out to uh the pd program again um i uh i i had i had an um an internship um offer through PD before I even started uh, school. And so like M MLT overall, uh, I, I would never have gone to, to HBS without um, MLT, would never have ended up at uh, Mars Wrigley with, without MLT. Um, so just the whole, I feel like the whole, um, pro all the programs together work to make sure that you you end up at the best place for, for your individual career path. Would like life, for your situation, because you have said a lot of, like it's been a lot of different support steps that have been throughout crafting your story, 
opening you up to HBS, your experience at that event you had there. Would you say like life changing is a fair way to explain it for you, for your specific story, right? Like, I mean, this is like a totally different switch from anything you thought. And then MLT came into your life. And now all of a sudden, like you're like off to the races. Is that correct for you? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, um, I was a history major in undergrad before I did career prep. So completely life-changing. <laughs> and now changing your own history. So there you go. Um, Asia, you're off mute, so it can go to you. Yeah, just quickly, absolutely life-changing for me. Um, would not have the um, the community that I, I have. Um, I consider my MLT um, friends family right at this point. Um, I know I can always lean on on those folks um, to support me through my my life and um, career journey. So honestly, yes, life changing. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Lifelong friends, life changing family, friends becoming family. David, go ahead. Oh, just two quick things on the life changing piece. I mean, I think all of us can agree that that's where this is. I mean, and I will say like one, it, it doesn't stop like once you get into school, like they, they you know, the coaches still support you. She even. I mean, she reviewed a, a scholarship essay I wrote and, and was fortunate enough to get in. She was like, you know, if you got anything else, please send it my way. I mean, I think just things like that, just you don't really appreciate till you're on the other side. Like, wow, that's, you know, she didn't have to do that, you know, and things like that. But second, I will say like MLT uh, probably, and I know we didn't talk about it, probably long-term for your career is absolutely incredible. Everyone I reached out to, you know, when I was you know leaving the military, trying to get into private equity, you know, I'm reaching out to MLT fellows, you know, if I see them on LinkedIn, I'm like, hey, you got a few minutes. And of course, everyone took the time to speak with me. But I think it was a big piece of what uh, helped me be successful making the transition to uh, finance. Yeah, I essentially echo um, what everyone has said so far. I think in terms of like formal programming, uh, MLT really helped with this like clarity uh, in terms of what I'd done before and where I wanted to go. Um, and then outside of the formal programming, the network, I, I thought the network that I developed um, going through the program was just phenomenal. Truly came out with lifelong friends, um, you know, people that I go to ski trips with uh, in Park City like David. Um, and I think, you know, in the next 20, 30 years, uh, the same individuals that I knocked heads with in MLT uh, during that period are the same individuals that I'll be doing business deals with, uh, going out with, um, and yeah, continually interacting with. It's awesome. I love hearing all the great stories, great experience. Maura, anything else you want to add before we wrap up? Just thank you to our students and alumni for joining us because it, you make, you, all the coaches, if they were here on this call, they'd be like, no, you were the best. No, you did that yourself. So I'm returning all their shout out love. Um, and thank you all for always uh, joining these types of events and connecting with candidates. So we appreciate you. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I'll echo that as well. Thank you all for sharing all your stories about your journey, about MLT, about your experience in school and the application process. Uh, hopefully our attendees took a lot of great insight. I know I definitely did and learned, learned a lot of different things today. Uh, this video will be live on our site, so we'll send it out to folks, uh, whether you were attending or not, and share it. You know, if you have friends, colleagues, uh, other folks who are applying and want some assistance and want some great advice, right? Uh, hopefully, you'll send this video to them, and they will hear me say that you should have sent this video to them, so they'll know why. Uh, so thanks again for joining us. Come back to our next event, and um, we have put the information in the chat to join future MLT events, as well as any contact information. So. Check that out in the chat before you head out. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you to our panel. Thanks more for putting it together. Have a great rest of your day, night, morning, evening. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Good one.